It is my privilege to welcome our guest speaker, Pastor Stephen Standridge. Uh, in our timelines of the Minor Prophets, uh, we would be in Zechariah, so we're actually going to be in Zechariah next week. Uh, so if you are interested in what goes on in that book, please come on back for that. If you are here for the first time, I want to welcome you. Thank you so much for stopping in and joining with us. I welcome all of our guests, and of course we welcome all those uh, who have been part of our church for many, many years. And so thank you so much for coming today. And if you're not aware, uh, Pastor Stephen Sanders has been a, a mission that our church has supported for the last seven years and so we are fortunate <clears throat> to be able to have an arm in outreach as he said during the Sunday school hour that uh, he is a part of our church and arms and legs in the uh, country of Italy uh, so we do uh, thank God for him we do thank God for his family and so pastor if you just come now and present God's word to us As our young sister was playing the piano this morning, I had to be reminded of my early days, uh, playing the piano in church and taking those first steps. And uh, actually, my dad was a missionary and, as well, and he would uh, speak in churches and he would ask me to play uh, uh, an arrangement that I put together and uh, it was with fear and trembling that I played. It was with fear and trembling that he listened. And it was, it was, uh, you know, it was a team effort. But how appropriate for our message this morning to be thinking of the way God watches over us as we try to play the piano of our lives Life is difficult, and there's ups and downs, and uh, the verses that were read here before the offering were something uh, I just touched upon this morning in Sunday school. Just the idea that, that God knows we're fragile. God knows that uh, we, um, we can miss the note once in a while, but he is not watching us with anger, with uh, a spirit of uh, like, oh wow, what are you doing? He, uh, he's cheering for us. I bet you we all listened, but none of us listened like her parents were listening. Her father was listening. And there's something very special about a father's heart in, um, in allowing us to take those first steps and cheering for us along the way and, and uh, seeing us grow. It kind of applies and ties into a little hello that I need to bring to you from my daughter, Eliza. She just graduated from Liberty University in songwriting and piano and guitar. And uh, she said yesterday when I told her we'd be here in Fulton, she said, that's the first church you asked me to play the piano in. And uh, she was up here and played a hymn for you guys and she said that was the first time I did it. And uh, so she said, give greetings to the church. And uh, you guys were patient with her and, and I'm, I'm here today. Um, but uh, praise God for young people that are learning to serve the Lord and doing it publicly, not being ashamed of um, the ministry of the gospel. And this is a, a lot about our message this morning because um, what I remarked this morning with, uh, with the church at Sunday School Hour, um, we are not part of a church to act on Sunday morning better than what we really are all week. This is not the day when, when we clean up and uh, perform something that is not real every day. And it's interesting as we think of maturity in our walk with Christ to think that um, we kind of have to 
add all these trophies and gold medals as we go through life, even the Christian life. And if I were to ask you this morning, what is a sign of maturity? What is a sign of maturity in our walk with God? What would be maybe the top two? Just wanted to think in your, in your heart right now. And then out of the two or top three, which one would you, would you say is the top sign of maturity? And I'm going to read to you a few verses that are going to sort of set the backdrop for our message this morning. And these are statements by the Apostle Paul, of course the, ones in, the one in Romans 7 uh, was one of his powerful statements. Romans 7, he just openly talks about his struggle with not being able to, to do always what what he would um, know pleases God. Well, as the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul, went through life, we find these statements in chronological order uh, that come from him and that are written in the Bible for everyone to read. 1 Corinthians 15, 9, 10, uh, gives us the first of these three statements. If you want to write it down, if you're taking notes, it's good to go and home and meditate on, on, on these statements. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Paul states, says, I am the least of the apostles. Later on in his life, he writes Ephesians, and uh, in chapter 3, verse 8, here's what he says, to me, Though I am the very least of all the saints, not just of the apostle, but I'm the least of all the saints, this grace was given. Grace was always paramount in his, in his mind. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Least of the apostle, least of all the saints. Now he's at the end of his life and he is writing his final words, his testament, so to speak. He's passing the baton to Timothy. And at the end of his life, Paul says this. This saying is trustworthy. This is 1 Timothy 1.15. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Other versions say, I am the worst, the chief of all sinners. At the end of his life, you think he would sort of Go in the other direction. The more Paul grew in his life, the more Paul matured in his walk with God, the greater was God and the smaller was Paul. The greater was the glory that we sang about of God, his mercy, his grace. Greater was his holiness and greater was in Paul the awareness of the ugliness of sin. So I ask you, why is it that so many times we struggle in being real, authentic with one another? And we struggle saying to our brother or our sister, if you're a lady, I'm struggling. I'm having a hard time. 
I'm having doubts. I fell miserably this week. Are you able to have at least one person with, with whom you can be real in this church? Does the pastor know how you are doing, how you are really doing? I was talking this morning, I didn't name the person, but a missionary, one that had grown in Italy as a missionary kid, missionary parents. He had stepped into the ministry. He was doing a wonderful job, but there was a secret sin that he had been just sort of nurturing and hiding in a masterful way. A sin that was, was in total contradiction with, with his commitment to, to God. He was serving, he was preaching, he was leading the, the church that was sort of like the, 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 the most vibrant of, uh, of the churches that our mission had in, in Italy. All of us, brothers and sisters, need to be real with someone. We need to ask for help. We need to share our need for prayer. And it's not just about our backache and our, you know, some chronic physical illness. It's about our hearts. And I, I just encourage you this morning, if this is the one thing you remember from this message, be real. Make sure that in church we can allow people to, to see how beautiful forgiveness is. How much we embrace God's grace and how much we believe in saying, hey, I offended you, brother. And in fact, I treated you in a way that was not pleasant and others saw it and I need to ask you and them forgiveness because I don't want to avoid you. I don't want to have to come to church and, 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 and avoid certain people in the church because our relationship is not good. Something happened and we haven't been able to solve it. Um, I just want to say very clearly this morning, Pastor has, I don't even, hardly know your pastor. He hasn't shared anything about you, okay? But what happened in the church once I spoke and, and at the end of the, of the service I say goodbye to people and I, I kind of joke a lot and I, you know, I, I kind of um, maintain a very casual approach. And, and one way to say goodbye to people in Italy is fai il bravo, which means just be good behave type of thing. So I uh, said goodbye to this couple, elderly couple in the church, and just said, hey, goodbye and, and behave, you know. Well, they ran to the pastor and they said, Steve knew something about us. You told Steve about us. <laughs> well, they, they got so angry, so upset, they didn't listen to him. Of course, he said, Steve knew nothing about you. Well, they left the church. They were a problem. <laughs> and uh, so if I say behave today, it's not because I know something, but I just know I need to behave. And we need to make sure we're not living uh, a different life on Monday than we do on Sunday morning. We may already go back to our normal self Sunday afternoon. But uh, I'm going to tell you the story today of a man who I could say had the PhD of failure. And the interesting thing is that God doesn't mind in his word. He doesn't mind giving us last names and, and address and, and names and of people that had sinned in the Bible. He records over and over, and in fact, it's often some of his special servants that fell into sin that weren't perfect, because you don't have to be perfect to be a Christian, right? 
And, and it's interesting that God, over and over and again, he, uh, like his chosen people, Israel, a lot of talk about Israel these days. His chosen people have not even recognized that he was the Messiah. And uh, have been going through all kinds of uh, ache and pain. Those people that said when Jesus was crucified, may his blood fall on us and our children. Think of the, the weight of those words. But God has a special heart for those who are his, no matter what. And we should understand that he is a God who loves to help us see our sin. Why? Because he loves to forgive it. And he loves to, to reconcile with you. If you're here and you don't know Christ as your savior, as the forgiver, I pray that you would know him today. Because that, that's what he loves to do. First of all though, he needs to expose our sin. These are the two points for this morning. God exposes our sin and God forgives our sin. And it's interesting to, to, to just think, how would you like it if your sin was written in a book, first of all, like there was a diary of all your sins? And how would you like it then for like the worst ones to be written in a book that is the, the most widely read in the globe? In fact, it's translated in, in uh, all kinds of different languages. I don't think he would like it very much. And this morning I'd like to speak about Peter, who was supposed to be a very special instrument of God, even in the early church, and yet, one after the next, if we go through the Gospels, we see Peter failing, failing, failing. And even as a leader in the church, he was a failure. So I'm going to go through this quickly with you just to um, kind of impress this thought in our minds. Remember Matthew 14, 28, Peter walks on water and sinks. We all know he took his eyes off of Jesus, shouldn't have done that. We wouldn't have done it, uh, but Peter did it. And Jesus said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Matthew 16, 21, 23, Peter rebukes Jesus. We know Peter often spoke out of place. And uh, when Jesus said to the disciples that he was going to Jerusalem and suffer many things and that he would be killed, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you, right? And he turned to, and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. How would you like for that to become your, your nickname? You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Now, would you have eventually picked this man to become your pastor? How would Peter have done if he had come here uh, candidating to be your pastor? You wouldn't want to know stuff like that about someone you would esteem and want to imitate, would you? Remember the day when Peter offered to build three tents because of the glory of God and he was there with James and John and, and saw this thing and, and just sort of translated into human terms and wanted to provide, you know, a little more time for Jesus to be glorious. And uh, he decided to, to see if he could set up three tents. And, and he was just totally ignored. 
You remember when uh, Peter came to Jesus with the wrong idea of forgiveness and he, he came and says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Remember, Jesus corrected him. No, it's, it's uh, way more than that. It's, it's without even keeping count. Remember Peter and his false promise in Matthew 26. Again, when uh, Jesus said to the disciples, uh, You will fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Gal Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples chimed in, said the same. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus again had James and John and Peter, and, and he asked them to just support him during a, one of the most terrifying moments in his life. And Jesus said to Peter, not the other two, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Well, there's more, but I'm just going to go to what happened when Peter was now a leader in the primitive church. And you remember there was a situation where Peter was approached publicly and uh, Paul had to oppose him in front of everybody in the church. Paul says because he was clearly wrong. Galatians 2. Before some men who had been slept, sent by James arrived there, Peter had been eating with the Gentile believers. But after these men arrived, he drew back and would not eat with the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who were in favor of circumcising them. So the other Jewish believers also started acting like cowards along with Peter. You'd think that after Jesus betray, was betrayed three times by Peter, Peter would have quit being a coward. After he saw Jesus resurrected, you'd think Peter would quit being a coward. Well, he was acting like coward. And even Barnabas, says Paul, was swept along by their cowardly action. When I saw that they were not walking a straight path in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you have been living like a Gentile, not like a Jew. How then can you try to force Gentiles to live like Jews? And in chapter 5, Paul says it even stronger. In verse 3, he says, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. If you do this, Paul says, you are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. So once again, how would you like it if you, like uh, Peter, would be corrected and opposed publicly? Would you thank God that he loves you enough to make sure that you walk a straight line, that you walk with him, and that you can ask for forgiveness, that you could repent and change your walk and and learn to walk in grace 
with Jesus, what do you think? How do you respond when you're criticized? When someone says that uh, you did something wrong? Husbands, how do you like it when your wife does that? Wives, how do you like it when your husband does that? It's not easy, right? Children, how do you like it when you're criticized? And parents, do your children criticize you sometimes? Have you asked forgiveness to your children for something you've done? How important it is to make sure that our relationships are honest, are clear, and open. Well, I'm going to commit to stopping by 1130-ish, because in Italy 1130 is sometimes before noon, okay? Not, don't, no, don't fret. Well, in Luke 22, we have the kind of the master of all passages uh, with Peter's failure. It is the most well-known failure by Peter. Luke 22, verse 54, Then they seized him, speaking of Jesus, and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the cordon and sat down together, then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You're also one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. This is important detail. Verse 59, And after an interval, about an hour, Peter, in other words, had already betrayed Jesus twice, had all the time to figure out what was going on and how he had sinned and betrayed his beloved master. A whole hour goes by and he still didn't get it. One more person recognizes him, him recognizes him, and uh, Peter, in verse 60, said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. Matthew 26 says that he cursed and started swearing just to make it even more credible. I don't know what you're talking about. And of course, immediately, while, this, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Verse 61. This is a key verse here. And this is the only gospel that records this moment. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. So Jesus was inside the, the house of the high priest. And somehow out of an opening into the courtyard, he was able to see Peter. He, of course, had heard each one of those denials. He had heard per Peter cursing, swearing that he didn't know, that he didn't know him. And Jesus looks at Peter, and there's something in the eyes of Jesus that turns everything around. Peter looked at Jesus, and, and do you think that the eyes of Jesus were filled with anger? at that point, judgment. Like, I'm going to curse you back. I am God the judge. I can take care of you now. Well, we know that was not the case because Jesus had told Peter that he would fail. And Jesus said, you will deny me. But I prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Those words came back to Peter's mind when he saw Jesus. And of course, what do we know? Is that he got up immediately, got up, went out, and wept bitterly. God loves to expose sin because God 
loves to forgive sin. And I'm going to conclude saying this morning, Peter was following Jesus from a distance. This could be part of the problem. He was uh, trying to hide in a crowd where he didn't belong. Is there any kind of compromise in your life? Is there any way in which you're trying to sort of blend in with everybody else? Well, if you have been doing that, there's a possibility that you've been sitting down, step two, by the wrong fire. That's where Peter was when Jesus looked at him. What is that fire in your life today? Could it be compromise? Could it be um, an attitude of rebellion toward God? Something he just was not supposed to do. And that's your fire. You have something going on with God where you oppose what he's been trying to teach you. It can be grief. It can be anything that is paralyzing you from following Jesus. Well, Jesus is looking to us this morning and, and he's saying, I'm praying for you. That your faith will not fail. It's interesting to see that Peter didn't say, well, oh, Jesus, yeah, oh, I remember now. But you know, if I get up right away, this is going to like kind of blow my cover. It's going to sort of prove that these guys are right. I know what you mean. I know what you did for me. And you know what? As soon as this fire is out, I'll get up. I'll go and repent. I'll go and cry. I'll feel sorry for my sin, but not right now. That's not how we do it, brothers and sisters. When God speaks to us about our sin, we need to get up immediately. We need to get away from that fire, whatever that fire may be, and uh, spend some time with God. May he help us this morning to embrace his holiness, his light, so that that light can come into the surgery room where he wants to go in and uh, take care of our hearts. Take out what needs to be taken out. And... Uh, and then he loves to forgive. May God bless us as we walk with him. Church, if you will stand with us as we close out our last song. We're going to close out our, our time together by singing, For God So Love. I love those two points. God loves to forgive us. Uh, God loves to uh, remind us of the sin that we've done. And as we sing this song together, God so love, let this be a reminder to us to share this same message with the world. God so love. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well. That never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come, all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved. The world that he gave us, his one and only Son to 
Let's close in prayer. Dear Gracious Father, uh, thank you for bringing us here together um, so where we can worship you together um, here on Sunday morning, Lord. I pray that you'd be with us this week. Um, and uh, as the missionary brought to our attention of, of acting just uh, the same as Sunday morning as we do on Monday morning, Lord, and throughout the week, Lord. I pray that as we enter the Christmas uh, season, Lord, that we would, we would keep you in mind as uh, we... Give presents to others as you have uh, given us um, your son to die on the cross for us, Lord. I pray for this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.